Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to our first book study of Star Wars Scoundrels by Timothy Zahn. I've been looking forward to this one. This is a great, it's just a fun book. If you like these sort of heist stories, kind of spy, um, you, you know, a heist is its own is its own subgenre. It's really done quite well. So hopefully you'll all enjoy it as much as I do. But with me as always is my trusty TA, Al Baca. Welcome, Al Baca. Say hi, Al Baca. <laughs> now we need to get me in there as Han. He said he's going to work on that before the next uh, next week's yeah. <laughs> study. No Jedi's in this book, but uh, but we'll uh, work that out. But that looks so cool. You did that so well. Uh, it didn't take me long. Like I said, it's a little rough, a rough around, a little rough, but it it works. It's good at that size. I like <laughs> how you maintained your facial hair even with Wookie head. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Got to keep the beard. That's awesome. I like that. Very good. Very cool. And welcome to the chat, everybody who's been hanging out with us thus far. Let's go back and see. I believe I believe we're up to Paladin Demo was the first, at least the first that I see. And I like his intro here. He's uh, he's giving us the Conan the Barbarian treatment. Between the times when the oceans drank New Orleans and the wars with the Tumblr cult and the Orange Man bat, <laughs> there was an age undreamed of. The professor of geeks wore a jeweled crown of mythology upon a troubled brow. It is I, the presenter, who is worthy to tell his sagas. Let me tell you about the days of high adventure. Or it would, it would have been <laughs> nice. Very cool. And uh, N Netter's Network, second. Uh, does that make me like super tie? I sure, sure. Yeah, okay. There okay, now I am Subital. Subital, that's right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what's your there, Paladin? Netter's Network, welcome. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Okay, that's, yeah, well. Okay. Sorry, I, I totally, wa totally wasn't ready. Like I said, my mind's spinning, so. That's okay, that's okay. Uh, see, Mr. Matchstick is here with a retracted message, but here nonetheless. Sound Engraver, welcome, says, how does a book study get a thumbs down? Does reading a book threaten you? I didn't even notice that until you said that. Uh, honestly, when it's it's usually whenever you speak out against the Snyder cult, they uh, there will be consequences. They, 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 um, they will try their best to silence you, even if it's lingering around your channel for a while to cause trouble. They, they do not like the truth being spoken, especially in a well-spoken, well-presented manner. It gets very much under their skin. Um, uh, Melissa Harris, welcome. Casey Scott, back to the drawing board. Stephen Cruz is here first. He says, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> Sertorian Clegane, Daniel Heron. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Tom Spiegel, channel member. Casey Scott asking how your mother is. Uh, she's back in back at the local hospital. Uh, she had two ulcers that were bleeding. Uh, today she had MRI and stuff looking for where the pain in her back is. She's very sore. Uh, sounds much better. Still a bit of a red. They want to put and they want to put a stint in um, one of her valves of our mm -hmm. heart. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, it's, it's still it's still it's still a little bit of it's still a road ahead. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. But thanks for the prayers, guys. Thank you very much. Absolutely, we'll keep them coming. And uh, so tonight we're going to go ahead and start scoundrels now if you haven't if, if you're still one of the holdouts and you haven't just bitten the bullet and joined our facebook group what are you waiting for uh let me drop the link in the chat because i did go ahead and provide as i said the first five chapters I mean, digitally if if we can get sound engraver and daniel heron to do it I know, on. right? Right. <laughs> we get those people on Facebook, <laughs> but uh, I did uh, provide you know some of these digitally for those who find it hard to, to get a copy. Although you can get used copies out there; they're pretty cheap. Um, and I did announce on on the Facebook group that we actually were only going to study chapters one through four tonight. Originally, it was going to be one through five, but as I was going back over it and rereading it and studying it, and then Al's reading it for the first time, Al had a good comment too and said, "You know this." There's a lot of info, and he's right because it's a heist story. So there's a lot of little detail. There's a lot of new characters, a lot yeah. of like you know different personalities that we're we're getting to know. Mm -hmm. um, surprise appearance from I mean for me it was a surprise of Winter. 
yeah, I was like, I thought she was, you know, something else. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> and I said, what are you waiting for? Pat and Demo said for Facebook to actually be secure and stop selling personal data. Well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to give them any of your data. You can just make yeah, up a big account. Yeah. But yeah, I understand. Well, I, I, I mean, I mean, okay. Well, I mean, what are they going to steal from me? That They're not going to steal anything you put on there. You can lie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, Daniel Heron, thank you for the $2. Said, what? What? I was distracted by DIY video. Yeah, he's been sending me some very d- interesting DIY videos. They, those are uh, perhaps uh, less said about those, the better, but <laughs> he's been sending them to me. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> I, never um, did wa- I never did watch that Sat- Satsiki video from last night. What? Uh, the Greek cucumber um, sauce. Satsiki. Is that a video I sent yours? I don't remember. No, no, no. It was, one, it was one I kept trying to watch, but I, I kept getting dings from you, and then we just started talking. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We were chatting. Yeah, yeah I forgot. I, just I never forgot. got around to watching. So, yeah. I know Good. vaguely how it's made, but. Yeah. Tom Spiegel says he's made it to chapter seven, hoping to stay ahead. Yeah, that's another way to do it. But uh, but if you're reading it for the first time, and if you're like me, I, I really enjoy a good heist story. At the same time, though, you know, different readers are interested in different things. So like when it comes to science fiction, for example, I I know some of you hardcore, like really legit science fiction fans might be mad at me for saying this. I don't much care if the science is spot on in a science fiction story. And, uh, you know, that's 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 a hard science fiction story. It's called from a genre perspective. I mean, you know, you want it to be straight on to a certain degree, but I'm already if I'm reading a book of fiction. You know, my suspension, my, my disbelief is suspended to a certain degree anyway. If you take me along with a good story, I don't much care for, oh, he didn't get the Hydra something to mug a muggle right or whatever. You know, I'm just not scientifically or technically minded. In science fiction, remember, there are two words. And both of them are equally important. Science and then fiction. Well, yeah, but then there, are deg- there are. Yeah, exactly. And there are degrees, right? So you have hard science mm-hmm. fiction, which is very much about getting the science right, you know, as much as possible. and um then you have more of the fantasy type. Yeah. And Star Wars has always been more of the fairy tale type anyway, too. So. Yeah. Um, but because I'm like that, because for me, like when I read a high story, I'm not so technically minded. So when they're given the layout of uh, Villager's Palace and they're giving the specs of the security system, and I'm st- and like my mind's like, yeah, yeah, big building, difficult security, got it. <laughs> you know? yeah. Whereas other people, other people who really like that kind of stuff, might really want to kind of, you know, map it out in their heads. And that's perfectly legit too, you know? And um, so, you know, it's, it's to be read kind of slowly and enjoyed at whatever pace you like to enjoy these kind of tales with, you know? Yeah. So, uh, well, well, I mean, I know it doesn't matter, but like in chapter five, when you had that whole, you know, we're not, I know we're not, it's going to be next week, but that whole following thing and mm-hmm. yeah. turn, turn here. Yeah. It's like, I'm trying to picture it in my mind what was going on. Mm-hmm. I don't well, like, like a, what this place look like. <laughs> yeah. Like a mystery too, you do have to have kind of the pieces matching up and stuff, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, so you know, if you find it, uh, um, I, I, it was easy for me to just get really wrapped up in the story from the start. But some people who are a little bit more, you know, like to pay attention to the details and the technical stuff like that, um, you know, stick with it because the, the story gets it's just so well done, and it's it really p- wraps up and picks you up and wraps you. Well, that's what I'm trying to say. It, you get wrapped up in it very shortly if you're not already. So. Uh, Want to go ahead and talk about chapter one or anything else you want to say about it overall before we get going? Uh, no, you know, you know, like it was, you know, interesting to, it was a good little setup. So, uh, I like this, uh, the shul guy. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. I just, you know, kind of like, uh, I hope this, you know, just, uh, borrowing the dominator. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we opened with. So we'll definitely talk yeah, about that. I, yeah. I I mean I could I could really see uh who oh, the ca- who was the captain now? I forget the Warven. Yeah, Warven. I mean I'd be ticked too to have this fat cat on my I uh, basically uh glorified taxi. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what he's become, yeah. Definitely. I'd be freaking captain of a star destroyer. Come on. Yeah. You know, I'd be upset. But yeah. that's, you know, I don't know if you want to go there. but No, well, let's go ahead and get into that um, because that is the opening scene, basically. We do start as, I don't know if every single one of Timothy Zahn's Star Wars books start like this, but I know at least the Thrawn trilogy did, and I know he likes to try and start like this whenever he can, but start with a Star Destroyer in space because that mm-hmm. 
as we said, is how all of the original trilogy films started, you know, space star destroyer, you know, and then we move on. Now I do want to point, draw attention to this. He's he, there's a way this starts. You, you want to start with, uh, Oh, Stephen Cruz for two hours. That's what would Big Al's Wookiee name be? I think we called Al Baca, right? It's, it's Al Baca. Yeah, it's Al Baca. Al Baca. There you go. <laughs> so we had to write that down. Al Baca. Um, had to put that in your name instead of Big Al. <laughs> um, nah, we still Big Al. <laughs> Big, Al Baca. Big Al Baca. There you go. One of the rules for starting a story, many of you might have heard this, is you want to begin in medias race. Latin term means in the middle of the action, basically. And you, you do that so you can grip the audience. You don't want to start with, there was a planet called Wukar, and it was a part of the system over here, and there was, and this is the history of it, this is the, that. Now, Star Wars fans might like reading something like that, but in general, for your own stories or whatever, you need to sell people on action, sell people on the scene, get them wrapped up in the story, give them characters they care about, then they'll be invested enough to care about any world building you have to do. So the general rule is to start in Medias Race. One of the biggest uh mistakes or pitfalls that young writers do are just in you know into um amateur writers you know before they become too experienced is they'll start in medias race and they'll say something like he looked out the window and noticed how the rain uh padded against the pane or something like that then they'll give you just a very minimal bit of action and then they'll launch into then he thought about what his father said and this this and that and then they just launch into this massive exposition dump and they think but it's okay i started with the action of him looking out the window no you that's not even nearly enough you know and the reason that's an that's a, a kind of a rookie move and it's a go-to move for a lot of more inexper inexperienced writers is because that's what they've seen done in so much popular fiction popular fiction i mean something like a star wars novel because most you know, quote unquote, avid readers have just been reading a lot of uh, popular fiction. Not, I mean, popular fiction can be incredibly literary, as we're pointing out here. But in terms of the demographics and in terms of the rules they have to adhere to, in terms of from an editor standpoint, they are quite different. Something between this and something like you know more of the literary genre, anyway. And editors of popular fiction want a lot of exposition up front because they realize that their readership is not necessarily skewing to the most intelligent of the population out there. Now, I mean, take that with a grain of salt, obviously science fiction, you do have to be of a certain level of intelligence to really understand, read and follow. But in general, you know, if it between reading a, a star Wars novel or Tolstoy, you know, that the editor is going to, you know, want some different things. So in general for popular fiction, for popular mass market, you know, uh, paperback, uh, kind of fiction, they, they have certain things they want from you. One of the things they want is a lot of exposition up front just to, to keep the reader uh, understanding clear and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Now, skilled writers like Timothy Zahn here, they know how to work within that constriction. They know in the confine, rather, they know how to say, okay, well, I'll go ahead and I'll give a little action. I'll give some exposition, but I'm still going to make it interesting enough to make it work. It takes skill to do that, though. This is why I always, always recommend to writers who aren't you know incredibly skilled with all these years of experience yet don't lay about a, a bunch of exposition in fact if you were a, a beginning writer writing this book for me i would say cut all that intro i mean if unless you hadn't written i mean this intro is actually well done i'll point out why it is in a second but if this was just a beginner's draft to me i would say start on page six after that break start with the shul and deja on the ship talking to each other as they're flying in and give all that exposition info through the dialogue that's where i would say is a safer bet but if you're experienced like Timothy's on, then you can really do something like this. We got the Star Destroyer Dominator arriving. We start Warvin's looking out at the ship, you know, uh, looking out at the, the planet. And he, Warvin thinks, you know, for all these, uh, these were not good times. The Emperor's sudden disillusion of the Imperial Senate, you know, so we, he places us, he uh, situates us right after Star Wars Episode Four, A New Hope. And this is when this story takes place. Um, then we get the information about Black Sun. Rebel Alliance and what's going on here. And as Al said, he, uh, the, the real thing that's sticking with Captain Warvin here is because of all this trying times, his big Star Destroyer has been commissioned as a glorified taxi for this this uh, imperial aristocratic fop, you know, <laughs> de Shul to come and uh, be taken. For, for as far as Captain Warvin knows, it's just a game they're playing, right? Yeah. Like I, for I, gambling. I, yeah, it's uh, uh, but uh, I, I I must admit, I like I like how I, I do like how Zahn does give us exactly 
a pro sets when this is happening. Yeah. Like I said, the you know Palpat Palpatine's new toy destroyed at Yavin. Now the entire sector, yeah. Now the Imperial Navy's on alert. The and, involved. and any captain, I'm sure he thinks his ship is one of the is probably the best in the fleet. And he's got this guy mm -hmm. who's, who's basically going to a poker game. Yeah, uh, exactly. as far as he knows. Or, mm -hmm. or uh, excuse me, uh, Sabak or Sabak. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, you know, and we have to have to remember, you know, we're, we get we kind of look at Star Wars universe from a hindsight, but we do remember at this moment after Episode Four, the precarious state of the Empire was that. Palpatine had dissolved the Senate and the only reason he dissolved the Senate was because the Death Star would be there to make sure that the local governors could keep all their planets in line and then they destroyed the Death Star so they took away that you know so that's why it's a little precarious you know not about to fall apart or anything but that's the the tension politically within the Empire I mean it definitely sets a statement mm -hmm. yeah like you know if 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 a, if a small rebel cell could do this what else are they going to be able to do? So, of course, you got the Imperial Navy on full alert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we meet Deshul, and this uh, this Imperial aristocrat, as, as Warvin thinks of him, and he is totally just you know playing. I mean, he's just over the top, just <laughs> ridiculous in every way. <laughs> like, what good do you do for the Empire at all? You know. And he's got this manservant uh, Deja, and they, they're uh, having a little back and forth kind of demeaning Captain Warvin, make sure you're no more than, you know, an hour and a half away or whatever it was, you know, in case I need to leave, you're my taxi again, you know, that kind of thing. Then after that break, we get Deshul and Deja on the shuttle going into Wukar. And then we get the, the subterfuge. We find out the truth behind it, which is that they're both uh, agents, Imperial agents. And that Deshul is supposed to be that he's been placed by the empire into the aristocracy so that he can be this a, a double agent there to kind of, you know, seek out any, you know, be a spy for them among the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And Deja is this incredibly skilled, talented special agent, as we shall find. And he's the one being inserted into Wukar to go after Villajor. They're after the Black Sun. They're after Villajor in particular. And I like the way it starts just. I should probably have you whipped, Deshul commented absently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before we know what's going on, it's just that it makes sense, you know, to Deshul. But then you find out that's not a a master and his slave talking about whipping. It's two spies trying to decide how to look, you know, play the part and you know sell it the best or whatever. So that's one kind of establishing a rule of heist stories. Nothing is as it seems. You know, you can't trust just anybody you know you're going by the end of any good high story you've got somebody's betrayed somebody or somebody was pretending to be somebody they weren't you know multiple people multiple levels of that so we start here with even these imperial agents before we even meet our scoundrels um, i'm probably going to leave them alone there after that but did you want to say anything else uh we do get some exposition uh, about quasati uh this agent from yeah. The Black Sun is coming there to Villajor, so we get a little bit of the setup and whatnot, but um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and move on unless you want to say anything more. Uh, oh, no, not about them, no. But I, I okay. think it's interesting that, we, that uh, they link this to uh, Caesar, uh, Sizor, Prince Shizor. Shizor, yes, yeah. Sizor. Yeah. 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 I was like, well, at least the same race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then our next... next um, section here before still we're not even a han yet now we get villager and we get this 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 guy that, that the imperial agents are going after and he himself is concerned so we've got these different levels you know we've got things nothing is as it seems or nothing can be quite trusted yet but we also get levels of power so you've got within the empire we have the agents the aristocracy the cap you know the military the warven even on wukar you've got villager the head of that, you know, planet at least in terms of the Black Sun, but he himself is is a uh, is answering to the Black Sun, and we've got this agent or our head, you know, person coming to check up on him, who is uh, Quasadi. And Quasadi, let me find the. Uh, I meant to have this pick up, but Quasadi is a Faline. and Faline, You've seen them before if you've watched right. Clone Wars and stuff like that. Uh, let me share the screen here. Whoops. Get the stream yard up. Do, do, do. But Follings can do... Did you know much about Follings before the book, Al? No, not really. 
Okay. Um, I'm just gauging different different Star Wars fans' experience with them. You know, they, they, this green skin, they've got the kind of spikiness and stuff like that, the the kind of shocks of hair on the top. But they're one of the things they're really good at, almost like uh, like Zeltrons, but in a different way, they're good at using the pheromones. So they can make you feel great fear. They can make you feel great love. If, you know, the one's trying to seduce you or something like that, they can, you know, they're, they've got this power over themselves uh, to release these pheromones. And that's one of the things, or they can put you at ease, you know, if they're, if they're um, interrogating you, you know, so, so it's, you know, they're good at that. <clears throat> yeah. And that was, uh, that is the race that Prince Prince Shizor was from, uh, what was the, uh, oh, the other book that is, is considered a uh, sequel. Um, Dark Empire? No. Uh, help. Prashizar. Yeah. What what book was that that he was in? Uh, oh, it was really popular. I can't remember the name of it. You're talking about Splinter of Mind's Eye? No, 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 no. There was a, there was a book that came out and Prashizar played. Black Sun for, Rising? No, that wasn't it. Uh, People are giving. I'm just reading the chat. Yeah. I can't think. Of, I can't think of it. Shadows of the Empire? That's it. Okay. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. Shadows of the Empire, I believe. Yeah. I think yeah. that was it. That takes place a little bit. So that's Prince Shizor from later, though. But uh, but yeah. yeah, this is this is still right after episode four. So uh, yeah, everybody's yeah. It's that delay. There's always that yeah, little bit was... of delay. So we ask a question, and then it takes a while for them to answer it. And they're answering it like you know, crazy because they don't think we've yeah. seen it yet. But then we're just on the delay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, I I mean, like I said, once I hear it, I, I knew what it was. And yeah, yeah, I, I remember it being. Yeah, I mean, I know it's like this. He, this it was a it's considered i think it's one of the few things that was considered canon well at least at one time yeah shadows of the empire that's what's eu it is canon it's um well, yeah. that, screw disney you know it's canon <laughs> you know? well you know what i mean yeah 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 even back then it was considered yeah definitely um so so quasadi is as you said, one of the nine the black sun's nine vigos here i just want to read this uh, little exchange they have here in the end, because Villajor doesn't know why such a high up person would come for him. He's obviously concerned that, you know, maybe he's be there to be replaced or something like that. Um, uh, so he, he bows. You may rise. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency Villager said, getting back to his feet. How may I serve you? You may take me to your guest suite, Quasadi said. His eyes seemed to glitter with private amusement. And then you may relax. Villager frowned. Excuse me, Your Excellency? He ca- he asked carefully. Your fear that I've, you fear that I've come to exact judgment upon you, Quasadi said. His voice still dark, yet at the same time oddly conversational. The gray-green scales of his face were changing, too, showing just a hint of pink on his upper cheeks. And such thoughts should never simply be dismissed, the Folly added, for I don't leave Imperial Center without a great cause. Yes, Your Excellency, Villager said. The sense of dark uncertainty still hung over the group like an early morning fog. But to his mild surprise, he could feel his heartbeat slowing in an unexpected calm beginning to flow through him. Something about the Folly's voice was more soothing than he'd realized. That's the, the the pheromones. But in this case, the cause has nothing to do with you, Quasadi continued. With Lord v- uh, Vader's absence from the Imperial Center, leaving his spies temporarily leaderless, Prince Shizor has decided it would be wise to shuffle the cards a bit. He gave Villager a thin smile. In this case, the most appropriate metaphor, you know, and so forth. So um, then Quasadi, uh, Villager realizes that Quasadi's playing with him with these uh, pheromones, doesn't like to be messed with, obviously. So we've got this tension, even though Quasadi's not there to check up on villager or do something with him you still establish that he's got a higher up supervisors there there's there's a possible tension something could go wrong with that relationship right mm-hmm. so um then we move on that's into chapter one did you want to say anything about chapter one mm-hmm. nope we're good i did just want to talk about deja here uh graver should like deja on the one hand he's very Apollonian and cerebral like a Thrawn, right? Zahn likes these kinds of these kinds of villains, except that he's not like Thrawn and that he's a hundred percent cerebral. And it's really the difference between the classic detective archetype and the hard boiled detective archetype, because Deja is very good at finding out what's going on and guessing this and that, and you know, putting things together as a detective mm-hmm. might. Except he's also very good and very skilled and very deadly. And I just oh, want to yeah. read this. So he's been going around trying to get a name for himself about somebody that has this glitter stem, you know, this drug, so he can kind of get an invitation to Villager's Palace. And these, uh, was it six? No, three. All three youths, they, they hear him talking about this glitter stem, and they're, they're following him now. They carried knives, and one of them had a small blaster, and there was a burning fire in their eyes that said they would have the spice no matter what the cost. Unfortunately for them, Deja had a knife, too. 
Once he'd taken off the body of a criminal who had similar plans, one that he'd taken off a body of a criminal who had similar plans. 30 seconds later, he was once again walking toward home, leaving the three bodies dribbling blood into the drainage gutter alongside the walkway. <laughs> I mean, 30 seconds. So this guy's got to be highly Ten deadly. 10 seconds per, per guy. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I mean, there's, you know, he's, he's highly deadly, even as he's highly good at figuring things out. So. Maybe Sound Engraver won't call him a Mary Sue of a villain. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I saw that. <sighs> I told her, I said, that's coming back. That's coming back. <laughs> no. um, so chapter hashtag, two. Oh, good. Hashtag, hashtag Pelion lives. Hashtag Pelion lives. So chapter two, we finally reach our heroes that we love, you know, that we know the characters that we were uh, familiar with, but that's a good, it's a good way of seeing it. You know, if you know, characters like Han and Chewie are going to show up in this story, you're probably willing to put up with a chapter establishing the, the other parts of the tale before you get to them. You know, you don't want to go too long before, before characters like that, you introduce them, but you know, that's, that's good. You know, it's a good sum. We'll sit through a chapter and having set through that chapter, if you've done it well and engaged us enough, then we know, you know, what's going on and we know, um, you know, we're into it. We've got the scene set. So Han is in this cantina and we find out that, you know, this is after episode four. So remember at the end of episode four, of course, he was going to get that reward for finding the princess. And then he was off because he had that debt to Jabba. He wanted to get that bounty off of his head. But being the, you know, having the good heart that he did and, you know, his conscience got to him and he finally came back to help. And of course, he came back at the most opportune moment and uh, was able to to save uh Luke, as he made that that run down the Death Star, so, so he comes back at this key moment. He's a hero, and if you just start watching Empire Strikes Back, you know you might be tempted to think, "Oh, well, he just stayed there then." But you know, he still got that bounty. He still got that. He still has to go at some point. You know, he's got to leave at some point. So he still takes that reward that he's given, and we get a little bit of that of that uh, exposition here as he's sitting there. He wanted to ask for more or something like that, but Princess Leia was right there next to him or whatever. Or um, no, the the captain didn't want to give him as much or something, but Princess was there, so she he acquiesced. But he lost it to pirates, so that's why he wasn't able just to use that money. Uh, he, you know, even he gets boarded sometimes, as he says, you know, for his smuggling, and he a- actually lost that to pirates. So he still finds himself without the money to pay back Jabba, and it's a very similar scene here in a cantina with uh, Chewie trying to find a job, trying to figure out how to pay back this debt. It's very similar to how we met them in the beginning of episode four, you know, on, um, on Tatooine. And then a bounty hunter shows up, of course, wanting to try and make good on it. Mm-hmm. Did you see the parallels there? Oh, the, well, please. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do like, you know, he kicks the table up and Chewie holds him and everything. And um, where's the line I had it? release he said oh he shot first you all saw it <laughs> you know mm-hmm. like one of that, that little thing right there but so nice they have little, the- nice, little, nice, nice little uh nice little jab at it yeah exactly exactly and having seen uh han you know do this that's what injure our uh our little sort of helpless main character or not main character but uh client the client for the heist that that makes him think that maybe han is his man so, so if injure, injure finally prevails upon him to to, to hear his story and he's this odd-looking little man. Um, the narrative says, or rather most of a man, half of his face was covered in a flesh-colored med seal that had been stretched across his skin and hair with a prosthetic eye bobbling along at the spot where his right eye would normally be. And it wasn't even a human prosthetic eye. It was an alien prosthetic eye. And then his right hand is all wrapped in med seal too. And, you know, it matches his story that he and his father were, were wealthy, that Villager's men had uh, robbed them. And in the explosion that left him rather disfigured, but he doesn't have the money to get it all properly fixed yet until they win back his credits. So 60 million, I think that was the number, right? Of credits. Do you remember? I was, you know, I mean, no, 63 million, 63 million credits, but they're in credit form. So they're keyed to only the people who can properly open it, which means injure is one of them. So villagers going to still have them on hand. That makes sense in the story until they can get them properly sliced for at least a fraction of their cost or something like that. So we meet our first, uh, in terms of our scoundrel list, we meet our first one there with this Rochelle Ree. And she's the first one that Han calls up and she's kind of like the Oracle for the, uh, <laughs> you know, for the star Wars scoundrels and smugglers and all of them, you know, she's like, uh, she can get in touch with them all. And she has an interesting story. She was used to be a, a uh, member of the Wukar aristocracy at one point, and she's just really good at 
slicing, hacking, doing all that stuff from her, you know, chair, her person in the chair kind of thing uh, in terms of her archetype there. And as we meet each of these new characters, each of our new team members here, we'll, we'll take a look and, and make sure that we see that you're introducing new characters. You're going to have to establish some level of competency with each of them to justify them being on this team. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you want to spend too much time with it or, or you know, be too involved with it because you do have such a large cast of characters. But you do have to spend a little bit, a little bit in there. So, Rochelle, first of all, we see her with the knob. She can check on this. She can check on that. You know, she's very uh, talented at this and that. But we'll see a little bit more of her, her skill set. But she's going to contact all of these people. I also getting like the, a little bit. Getting the team, getting the team together. Yeah, right. Yeah, getting the team together. Exactly. And I like that we've got a little bit of this. Um, you see a certain level. It's subtle. But did you see it too, Al? Like Han's a little bit mm -hmm. of a schmoozer. Like, you know, Rochelle is a little uh, like there's a little bit of ten sexual tension. Not yeah. a lot. Well, a yeah. Every Everyone he meets, even later when we meet a couple other people, he's kind of. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, we'll think, we'll think of Han's character. I mean, he was like that. I mean, with Leia, right off. He he just exactly. I mean, it's Harrison Ford for God's sake, a young Harrison <laughs> Ford. If I look like that, I'd be flirting too. Yeah, yeah. He's got this. He's got this uh, innate swagger that the girls mm -hmm. react to. They don't just fall at his feet for it or anything, but they react to it a little bit. He but is, what's funny? Oh, good. He is still at this time the embodiment of the rakish robe. Exactly, uh, exactly. I mean, he hasn't been tamed yet by by Leia. I mean, he he. I mean, there's some, you know. I'm sure he's thinking about her, but still, there's mm -hmm. uh He's he's not. You know, she hadn't put a ring on it yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. he's he's you know he's letting it fly wherever. And it's funny that uh, for all of this level of of uh, swagger that we see with um. With Han, it's all dialed up to eleven once Lando comes on the scene, which I love. We'll get to yeah. that when we get to it. But you know, setting the levels of the characters and whatnot is funny. Uh, at the end of chapter two, we get a little hint that some of the people, you know, were were busy. Some of them recommended other people. Mazik, who we remember from the Thrawn trilogy, of course. Mazik was the uh, the guy that um, Thrawn picked up. Hey, look, I haven't once said card instead of Thrawn. Maybe that's because card's not in the story. Yeah. Um, now that I've said the word card, I'll probably start mixing them up. But anyway. yeah. you'll, uh, of, you'll say card instead of Mazic. Yeah, probably. I don't know. Anyway, Mazic was the guy that Thrawn picked up and then said, look, I, I don't, you know, everything's forgiven. You know, he's the one that he used to try and dupe into that that mm -hmm. smugglers meeting that uh, card was, was uh, planning. Yeah. So uh, we do find out that Mazic is sending two people that he trusts. And that's sort of a like, whoa, you, you know, but they know magic. Magic won't work with anybody he doesn't trust implicitly and hasn't tr thoroughly tested. So they decide to go along with it. But these two strangers are going to show up from magic. So we'll, we'll meet them later. But we move into chapter three with meeting our uh, some of our other candidates that, that Han and Chewie are going out to try to try to recruit. And first off in chapter three, we meet the twins, Bink and Tavia. And let me... um. I know I've got a picture of Bink at least, and if you've seen Bink, you've seen Tavia because they're they're absolutely identical. But see if yeah. I can find a picture of the two of them together. Why do you do that? I can't. I'm trying to remember where it was, but uh, there was a little interplay where where they were talking about someone was surprised that Han and Chewie were still together because uh, yeah, yeah, the smugglers, you know, there there always seems to be a falling out. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, and it, and it dawned on me, it's like, how much uh, of uh, a load off of his mind does Han have knowing the loyalty Chewie has for him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with I just the life debt, you know, as we know. But yeah, with the, with the life debt. Well, like I said, you know, with any other kind of like little, you know, scoundrel combo, you know, partners or, or you know, whatever you may how, whatever term you may use, there's always this, you know, the backstabbing is always a possibility. One kind of goes off on his own direction. Hans got himself a partner for life that he is 100% can trust. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just think that, I think that might add a little swagger to Han. <laughs> he's got this you know he's got this muscle behind him who will basically do anything he needs 
Oh, and to protect, you know, it will protect them at any cost. Mm-hmm. I just think that's a great well, plus. Point of his mind, off his plus, mind. I imagine it makes him even more attractive to the ladies because he's a scoundrel and he's a bad boy, but he clearly has loyalty to his friends. So there's a little bit of little <laughs> level of safe or little level of maybe I can tame him too, you know, <laughs> which is makes it even mm-hmm. more irresistible and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's when um when B- when Bink is watching them. Uh, watching him leave and sees Chewbacca go with him or whatever and has those thoughts. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Bink on the, the right hand of the screen here. This is Bink anyway. And Tavia is her, her, her uh, twin. Um, how, do, how, we, how do we know that's not Tavia? I'm guessing because of the, the, the harness and the, and the guns and everything, Tavia is more the, the watch person and stuff like that, but you're right. Could be Tavia. Okay. okay just wondering. Just wondering. Just wondering. <laughs> um, I don't, don't know well enough yet to know one or the other. <laughs> So if you look at the way chapter three starts, this is another really great example of how to start a tale in the middle of the action, but give the exposition naturally as it comes. So I'm just going to read a little bit. So we've got the rooftop defenses were intriguing. The long slide down the st- uh, synth rope was exhilarating. The window security was a joke. Bink Kedick shook her head and she focused the medical laser beam through the trans steel onto the alarm connector. Most amateur thieves who got this far, she knew, would use the laser to slice all the way through the links, successfully disconnecting the primary alarm, but at the same time activating the impedance circuit that would trigger the secondary. Bink's more subtle approach, burning the connector just enough to melt the wires into the short circuit, would leave all the warning bells intact, but quickly and smoothly drain the alarm's power cell and render it useless. So you're in the middle of a of a, of a break-in, which is thrilling, and you want to kind of stick with that, but it shows you talks you through what she's doing and you're in her head, you're in that free and direct discourse or in her mind. This was called free and direct discourse. When your third person narration is in the person of one of your characters. So we've got this idea of uh, we get this exposition. We find out these little things like this is why she did it this way, not that way. Now that tells you something about her. It tells you that she's skilled, that she knows what she's doing. She is the right person. She's, you know, a formidable, you know, uh, person to deal with when it comes to one of these kinds of jobs. And then we also get, the information about her sister. So she's, you know, working no more than the alarm should be deactivated. 20 seconds, no more alarm should be deactivated. Sitch, her sister's strained voice came from the comm link clip on her shoulder. Bink smiled fondly. Tavia hated Bink's work, hated every single minute, every single aspect, every single job. But even with all that, she was still far away in the best ground linker Bink had ever worked with. So we got her, her sister, Far away is the ground linker, you know, the, and she's the one, you know, worrying over her and stuff like that. You just establish all of that with the with the uh, with the um, story as it goes, even right down to she hears Tavia kind of startle for a second, and then she says, "Is everything okay?" And she said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, crank a packy." And this is weird, like you know, cutesy little word, crank a packy or pinky or whatever. You know, what, what is that? You know, but it's you get the idea of these sisters, these little sisters, who um, if you've known sisters before, or maybe you're somebody who has a sister, if you're you know two girls, two sisters together. They have these cute. It's not uncommon. I don't want to speak for every right. level group of sisters out there, but it's not uncommon for these cutesy little phrases and these little inside they, jokes and this certain level of Gilmore Girls to take they place. Their, <laughs> they have their own little language. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> you're right. They have they, they can talk to each other and nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. And they can what irritate. The heck they're talking about sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and they can irritate the heck out of each other. Yet they're fiercely protective of each other at the same time, right? Uh, as we'll see with Bink and Tavia. And I, I like the fact that they're okay. Oh, I was just say, uh, crank a packy. What a great T-shirt! <laughs> just put that word on there, and people who get it get it, and people who don't don't. <laughs> Hashtag crank a packy. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and as soon, and then we get a little bit of that that Han swag uh, when Bink finally gets back outside. Then as the man passed through, and she sees this man, the silhouette of a man coming for them. Then as the man passed through the light of a home security lamp, she got a clear look at his face. She exhaled in a puff, feeling the tension drain into limp relief. No wonder Tavia had been startled. And no wonder she said, crank a Hey, Solo, she greeted in the newcomer. What are you doing with Taylor? <laughs> so uh, I like the little game they play about, you know, nope, she's Tavia, I'm Bink, you know. So we, well, again, uh, emphasizing how identical they are because that, you know, that's going to come to play, you know, in the story. So. But, but, uh, but I, playful. and I like the fact that Han is able to tell them apart. Yeah, yeah. He, he's got for for he's he's uh he's in tune enough that he can, he knows. 
Mm-hmm. Or at least he knows the fact that they commonly pull this trick anyway. Yeah. Even if he but, can't pull, you know, tell one from the other necessarily. Yeah. But uh, but I think he's he's more intuitive about it than anybody else would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we uh so so they offer the job. You know they're probably going to take the job. You know it looks good. So now we move on to our next recruit, and that is our person to the next uh, one slot over from the right, Zerba Chertik. And he's a Belisorian. They go to this this land or this uh, city here where there are these performers, street performers. The Belisorians do look human except for those little antennae, which they can retract all the way down to their head if they want to. But they're, they're good for sensing, good for heightened hearing and all that kind of stuff. And he is a sleight of hand man. He's a he's a, 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 a losing or what are the words. Um, there's a word I'm looking for. Sleight of hand and. Art of illusion or something like that. Yeah. Anyway, he's got all these little tricks and things up his sleeve and they need him for that. They also, but he's a performer. And what I like about this is that he's written as a performer. Um, Santa Grieva says, I think those words are also expressed among twins. That may be a a trope of sorts. My twin and I never had that. Uh, Chris P. I think I might be jumping in the middle of a, but I'm tagged there. A trope of, so, oh, it's a trope. So she, Sound Engraver never had those words with her twin. I think she's saying. Oh, so it's a that's, trope. that's so not Crankapaki. That's not Crankapaki. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, you know, it's a, it's not going to be true of every case, certainly. But um, I don't really know a lot of twin sisters, but I know a lot of sisters and I see some, you know, it's common in some of those. Um, But Zerba is, He's a performer, and if you know a lot of performers, they are a little bit thin-skinned when it comes to their pride and their, uh, you know, making sure that you think enough of them and their work and this and that. And we get a little bit of that with Zerba. I like, uh, for example, when Han asks, "By the way, our, our Han knows not our Wookie tells Chewie tells him too. Don't don't tell him he's the eighth on our list. You know, he won't he won't like that. You know, <laughs> and uh, Han's almost." Uh, for a half second, Han was tempted to go ahead and tell Zerba that he was actually number eight on his particular skill list just to see how the other would react, but he pushed the thought aside. Zerba probably didn't have a ship of his own, and Han had no desire to have a depressed Balasar moping around underfoot the whole <laughs> way back to Wukar. <laughs> and then later, when he asked him, um, oh, by the way, do you still have that lightsaber? Zerba's head snapped back, his eyes darting between Han and Chewie. Wait a minute, he said suspiciously. Is that what this is about? All you need is my lightsaber, you know. <laughs> you only want me for my lightsaber, not my amazing artistic skills, you know. He's got that. He's got that performer sensitivity, which I love, you know. <laughs> Actor. But I love. I love the concept of this lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps shrinking. He doesn't know why. It's like, yeah, I still have it. The, the, the blade legs down about 15 centimeters now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know why it keeps shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know the ins and outs of lightsabers, you know, beyond what I know from the Knights of the Old Republic games, but, uh, but it's a funny thought. But uh, yeah, he's bringing that. I, I do like this little trick. So again, establishing competence with each other. And we saw Bink and Tavia, you know, do their successful break in and their knowledge about this and that. Well, Zerba's on this um, on this land because he's in hiding, and part of it, you know, he's an indentured servant to these people as a performer, and they keep watch. But he's been preparing at any given time for the moment when he might have to escape. So he does this, pulls this egg from his pocket, and suddenly his clothing just changes automatically, and it's just like almost like magic, right? And uh, Chewbacca grumbled, and Hans uh, hadn't seen that one before, huh? Han asked and headed off through the crowd in the opposite direction. Someone told me once that it's just a silk outfit with the tearaway seams and connecting threads that yank all the pieces off and into that egg thing he was holding. Chewbacca seemed to think that over for a moment, and then he growled again. Well, yeah, I'm sure it sounds easier than it really is, Hans said. Boil it down, and all we do is move cargo from one place to another. <laughs> you know? so, so there's a there's a there's a logic behind it but he's got this sort of you know sleight of hand and and, you know all that kind of stuff he's able to do establishing competence next we meet our last person that they go out to recruit specifically who is dozer and dozer's the man on the far left of this image he looks like a dozer yeah it looks like a dozer right and he's uh sort of a bigger burlier guy he's a ship thief first and foremost but they are uh deciding to 
recruit him as their front man, the kind of con man, the con artist for this job. They figure they'll need one of those. And for, not for the first time here, uh, we'll see. Um, beside Han, Chewbacca growl, they're watching him in the distance because we need a front man, Han told him, someone who can pitch a good story and make him believe it. He nodded toward the arguing duo because they see Dozer arguing with somebody off in the distance. Dozer's got the presence and confidence and even a hint of a Corellian accent. And Chewbacca, not for the first time, uh, says, why don't we just get Lando? Lando's really great at this. Lando would be much better. And uh, Han got a firm grip on his temper. Was Chewie never going to drop this subject? Sure, Lando could probably do it better, he said with forced patience. And no, we're not calling him. End of subject. He glared up at the Wookiee's stubborn expression. And I mean the sub end, end of subject. Got it? And he says, uh, the irritating part was Chewbacca was right. Lando Calrissian would be the perfect front man for the scheme he had in mind. No Corellian accent, but smoother and more urbane than Dozer Creed could manage on even his best day. Excuse me. But after the Elysia incident, Lando had told Han in no uncertain terms that he never wanted to see him again. The fiasco with the Yavin Basilica statue had done nothing but strengthen that animosity. So you get the idea that there's been a history of incidents between Han and Lando, <laughs> after which Lando is quite done with Han. Now, we know from Star Wars lore and it's, you know, even the, the, the sort of bastardized version of Disney has become more generally known that, that Han got the Millennium Falcon from, from Lando. But we know that in Empire Strikes Back, when he goes to Cloud City there, there was something, there was some last incident, last occurrence between Han and Lando that did not end well. And that, that, Han, that Lando might be quite put out about. And that's why Han's sort of nervous to show up there. So that we're going to find out what that is, because you think about the timing. This is right in between episode four and Empire Strikes Back. So, you, you know, a lot of guts coming here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to. Oh, excuse me. Crack my knee there. So we're going to find out what Han pulled, you know, part of this book. But uh, but we get that right. So he's not going to No, Stop it. Enough. We're not bringing Han in. <laughs> now we get a little bit of establishing of Dozer. Dozer's competence, and primarily he's a ship thief, like we've said, but he does have that that smoothness, a little bit of a con man to him. And this little thug decides to try and hold up Han and Chewie. And I, lo I love the Chewie acting like he's a Wookiee with a heart condition, you know, waving back and forth. I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> um, so that they can kind of turn around and get the jump on this little kid holding him with a gun because Dozer has stolen this kid's ship apparently and they don't uh you know he's kind of holding them hostage or whatever to see if they're in with him or whatever dozer finally gets there once they've taken the gun and uh we have someone who isn't very happy with you han told him he's too choked up to explain you want to give it a shot and dozer shook his head sadly jeffster jeffster he admonished the kid i've already told you your ship's over in the north quadrant i looked the kid ground out the words coming with no out with no obvious effort bay 250 just you said 250 dozer sighed theatrically Jeffster, I said 215, 215. The kid looked up, a stricken look on his face. 215, he repeated weakly. 215, Dozer said firmly. I'm sorry, I really thought you heard it correctly, but no harm done, eh? He pulled out his comm link. Tell you what, I'll call over to the gate supervisor. Tell him you got confused and you have to conf uh, and have him confirm it for you, all right? No, the kid said hastily, struggling back to his feet. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll just go over and I can find it myself. So when the kid leaves, Han says... Uh, Where's the part? He says, why did you, uh, what would you have done basically if, uh, if he had said, yeah, go ahead and call the, uh, the shipyard. And Dozer says, uh, well, you did have his blaster, but still, I believe a great is a great poet once said, discretion is the foundation of continued existence. Um, I can't find exactly the words, but basically he said he's young and young people are all about their pride. And he never would have wanted me to call over to the shipyard and let them find out what's going on. And then he has to go face them and find out that he just got a number wrong, you know, so a good understanding of people. We see that competence, you know, exhibited with Dozer there, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a side competence because his main job is ship thieving. It said a uh, young man of his age will go to extraordinary lengths to avoid being embarrassed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you found that. Yeah. I couldn't find it right off the fly, but yeah, good. Yeah. So a good, a good insight into people, which is uh, which is a cool character there too. So we get our, our little group back with Dozer and uh, Zerba. Pink and Tavia, you know, made their own way, of course. And we fly back and we we find out that we get a little bit of Rochelle and establishing of her competence more. She was able, you know, she said they've got this festival coming up. 
all of the good places downtown are, are taken, you know, but she's able to slice them a, uh, a place anyway. This two room suite, not just a little hovel, but it's this furnished two room suite. And his dozer's looking around. He says, I'm impressed. And Han can tell you that's not easy to do. I can boost ships all day long. How in the empire do you boost real estate? Rochelle shrugged. It's not that hard when you know how. That doesn't tell me anything, Dozer said. It wasn't intended to. Rochelle reassured him. <laughs> Dozer, glad to set off. Yeah. So uh, we're start. So we we've established the the competence of them. We also meet our our two. Uh, here we have Winter front and center in this picture too. This is our Winter. We known, of course, Princess Leia's uh, childhood friend and and uh, number two, you know, assistant in all things. But we also found out in the Thrawn trilogy that during the during the rebellion, she'd worked as an agent for the rebellion. So uh, I haven't gone through all of the EU, you know, from this time period or anything. So I don't know exactly if this is before she, but I mean, you know, she grew up with Leia on, on, um, and Elderon. So we, you know, she would have been involved. So she's undercover basically, but this is when Han first meets Winter. She's one of the two that Mazik sent. And we find out about her. What's the word I can never remember. Didactic memory. Um, something like that eidetic memory something like that anyway she remembers everything she sees every conversation and so forth every detail which is highly useful to them in a job like this and then we meet kel who's a younger kid and he says that he's got uh knowledge of explosives setting them this uh uh taking them apart he also knows stuff about droids so you know we, we were told their competence a little bit then all of a sudden rochelle says oh he's here the last <laughs> That's one of their part in walks Lando. <laughs> it took Han a second to find his voice. Rochelle, can I see you a minute? He asked, forcing his voice to stay casual. <laughs> and uh, Rochelle says, well, you told me, you know, you told me to send for him. I got the message afterwards. And then Han realizes it's most likely chewy. <laughs> he says, like, damn it. I told him no. And that's one of the things you can eidetic memory. Thank you. Netter. Um, but yeah, it's like that's one of the the uh, the, the pros of being able or, or the archon, depending on whose side you're on. But in a partnership like that, that is so loyal to each other, you can get away with stuff like that, right? <laughs> it's like Al, Al gets away with stuff on my channel that nobody else would get away with, <laughs> but Al Baca gets to because he gets the Al Baca pass. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so Lando's here. Oh. <laughs> Lando's here, and. Uh, and of course, Lon, Han is still wanting to be fair with everybody. So he says, no, we're not going to take the, the share out of your credits or anything. It'll still be uh, split up. But uh, obviously, in a second now, Dozer's going to take Han aside and say, well, what's you know what's going on? Because Dozer knows that Lando's way better at being a front man than he is. He knows that's sort of a second skill of his is primarily one is, is ship thieving. And you think about we've got all this team together now. We're establishing their competence. We're establishing some of the fun little relationships or quirks, you know, with how they're going to work together and the chemistry of this job. But you also have to remember that in a heist, you know, these are scoundrels. They're pulling off a heist. There, There's usually a betrayal, at least one betrayal or something, or somebody not sticking with the plan or something. You know, there, there's tensions of things that could go wrong. And Zahn is doing a great job of establishing possibilities from the start. Now, none of these things he establishes necessarily has to play out in the end, but he does a good job of establishing. And then Dozer, for example, I think from the start, even before Lando gets there, he's somebody who knows he's there for his second skill, not his first, you know, and um, so little things like when when Kel talks about how he's good with droids, so of course, Dozer said dryly, and knowledge of droids is essential to any good caper. Actually, in this case, it is, Rochelle told him, Villager's vault includes security droids. Oh, Dozer said, sounding a bit off stride. But uh, like Kel, he recovered quickly. Well, well, that's good to know. Uh, what about you, Winter? <laughs> you know, it's so little things like that. Then you've got a couple of times where Dozer's sure to kind of like, you know, put forth the piece of info, trying to be useful a little bit. And then he pulls Han aside and says, so what's what's going on now? You know, and Han says, well, obviously, if Lando's here, we'll let him do that job. But we'll still have things for you to do. Um, you'll still get your cut and everything. But we still have that lingering truth overhead that the 63 million credits is being split a lot of different ways now or among a lot of different people now so again just that added little bit of tension there um <laughs> oh god steven cruz <laughs> steven cruz for two dollar lando's droid good with droids too only in disney canon steven cruz only in disney canon <laughs> um <laughs> 
Uh, oh, we also get to see Winter in action a little bit when they talk about the the speeders that have come to Villajor's uh, mansion there a couple times a day or whatever. And she notices it's actually the same speeders. They're just changing out the tags because she knows the same small scratches, dents, and other marks and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, Dozer wants to go outside and look, but they call him back in because you know they'll, they'll see you and stuff like that. Uh, we get a little bit of Lando's smoothness. This is what I wanted to talk about. Um, let's see. So they decide that somebody they, they they'll need to. The first job Han says is to get somebody inside to take a look, to take a closer look, because they get the information about what kind of vault it is. And um, Bink warns of the honey traps. She calls them and stuff like that. But they figure out somebody's going to have to get in to take a quicker look or a closer look. Uh, only one way to find out, Dozer said, which one of us gets to be Villajor's new best friend. No contest, Lando said, smiling at the twins. I nominate Bink. Why, thank you, sir, Bink said, smiling sweetly back at him. I just love making new friends. Again, he's got this sort of, uh, this sort of, they know the, they know the game he's playing. It's not like he's just duping the women around him, but he's so freaking charming about it that it's, it's like they can't be mad at him either. Like, for example, when he says, uh, how, you know, how frequently do these people come and go? And they find out, you know, is this, is we got like half hour or something like that. He says, uh, good, you know, just in time for a snack. Do I smell this, this and that? And they find out all the food that he's going. And, uh, so just enough time for a snack. Lando concluded, uh, Inger says, yeah, but shouldn't we keep watching? I'm watching it. Lando assured him, turning back to the window winter. Tell me when you see a likely land speeder. Bink, would you do me a favor and get me a sauce plate of those carny chips? <laughs> Bink oh. said Tavi a wry smile. They knew Lando all too well. Sure, she said, and headed toward the kitchen. I mean, that's just talk about a confidence man, right? He is the right man for this job, just walking in the room and exuding that confidence and trying to, you know, that natural charisma that just kind of gets people on your side a little bit, you know? Oh, um, yeah. And yeah, Sound Engravers, he says, yeah, Tavia's frosty attitude to Lando is totally relatable. Twin sisters are protective to one another regarding the interfering man. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's a perfect example. They're going to be protective of each other. And yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, and another bit of Lando's, uh, competence here as well, because he just walks in and he's the legend Lando. But as far as this story, we've got to show him exhibit a little bit of confidence. And as they're watching our competence, and as they're watching this new speeder go in, and then he sees somebody goes out. Interesting, Lando murmured, his electro binoculars. That man just lost something. What did he lose? Dozer asked. I don't know, Lando said. It could have been credits, prestige, or power. But the changes in expression, the body language, very clear. Whatever he lost, it was something he wanted to keep. So at the beginning of the book, we have the little cast of players and Lando is listed as a gambler like that's his primary uh role you know so being a gambler knowing how to bluff knowing how to read people you know that's part of it uh that makes him the perfect confidence man you know we've got Han Solo smuggler Chewbacca smuggler Calrissian gambler Bink Kiddick ghost thief Tavia Kiddick electronics expert ghost thief assistant Dozer Creed ship thief Zerba Churdick, pickpocket, sleight of hand expert, winter living recording rod, <laughs> Rochelle Ree, acquisitions, intel, Kel Tainer, explosives, droid expert. And then uh, those that's the, that's the team anyway. Then you've got the, the villains and Inger and stuff like that. So so we've got a team. We've got a team. Uh, it looks like they're perfect. You know, if you ever watched the show Leverage or even a team to a certain example, you know, you got to have your team and each one has their role. Each one has the part where they're needed, you know, what they're needed for the job and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's just, it's a perfect setup. We like teams. We like, you know, readers (laughs) like to follow stories that, uh, what do you mean? Compared to to a team that makes Lando face. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Maybe Han would be, uh, I can't, I guess Chewie. B.A. Barakas. Oh, yeah. Chewie's definitely B.A. Barak. I don't know who Murdoch is, though. Maybe Zerva. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. um... Yeah, I'll be Dozer. I'm thinking Dozer. Sorry. Uh, then at the end of Chapter 4, we, we go back to Deja again. Let's not forget Deja. So now you've got all these different players. It's not just a simple matter of our heroes who happen to be the scoundrels and they're wanting to break in and steal something. But in, as far as they know, they're, you know, I mean, they don't care, but as far as, as far as we know, they're exacting justice, right? They're giving, giving something back to some, to somebody whom something was stolen from. 
Um, and then you've got the person who stole it, Villager. You know, so you got the good guy, bad guy. We've also got this third party to complicate it a little bit more and make it more interesting, which is the Empire. Deja there is a special agent looking to get at Villager for his own reasoning. And then you've got Quasati there, you know, Villager's superiors in the Black Sun Gang, complicating a little bit more. So it's it's a lot of moving parts here, and it makes for a promising, involved, really fun tale. And to kind of set that, start crossing those wires immediately, at the end of chapter four, we get Deja pulling out some of his shenanigans. He finally got a, 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 a meeting with one of Villager's agents uh, for the uh, glitter stem, and he gets them to take back a sample of it. He's wanting to, to partner with Villager, he says, and he follows them back. So they're, you know, they're going to go back into the mansion. So he's trying to get an ine inevitable invitation that will come from Villager to meet with him. But as he's leaving, he sees a speeder outside watching the gate of the mansion. And this, of course, has got to be Han and his people. And suddenly Deja puts them under surveillance, too, because, as he says, he doesn't want a gang war breaking out. You know, that'll mess up his plans. Of course, that's not what Han and them are doing. But, you know, you're starting to cross the wires again, just starting to lay that ground for tension. That's a perfect first act of a of a book. You know, let's get the uh, we got introductions to all the players. We've got all of the possible tensions laid out, all the possible little strings and things that could be pulled. That's perfect. You know, um, so really good, solid first act. Even if your mind's spinning a little bit from all the new characters and the new, you know, bits of details and info, hopefully at least it's got you excited and, and interested for what's going to come because because it is a good fun. It, it's such a good. This is the the the. You can tell when a a universe like the Star Wars universe that when it's really got a good hold on consciousness is when it the public consciousness is when it can survive being divided up into these little subgenres. It's like the the MCU before uh before Captain Marvel and Endgame. You know, you were able to tell such vast and varied stories like uh Winter Soldier, you know, an, an a total 80s Cold War espionage thriller uh and you could turn around and tell Ant-Man. <laughs> you know, a light heart, you know, comedy or whatever, you know. So uh you know th this is and this story holds up. It's 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 localized. We're just on this one little planet. We're not on the galactic level necessarily. We're just dealing we're not dealing with Jedi and these super mystical powers. We're just dealing with smugglers and and thieves and you know on that more zeroed in focused level. So you can do that kind of thing even if you're working in a in a sandbox that has larger grander possibilities as long as you're able to focus in, you can tell certain types of stories that match it quite well. So I think uh, I think I've talked myself silly on these <laughs> first four chapters. Anything I want to add, Al, or react to? <laughs> um, no, <clears throat> no, pretty good. Okay, cool. Well, uh, feel free to to throw out any questions or comments in the chat if you do have them. While while we wrap up here, but I've decided that we're going to just first for scoundrels. Since it is a lot to go into with the machinations and the missions and the things like that, we're going to stick to four chapters a time. And because this is 24 chapters in all, that makes six six weeks of this. And before you get impressed by me doing math, I will admit that I asked Alexa to do that for me earlier. So I've just prided myself for remembering the answer. <laughs> so, five, so, so five through eight. Yeah, yeah. Five through eight for next time. So uh, four chapters at a time. So it's going to be fun. Uh, and and I will I will try to go ahead and quote unquote, make those next four chapters available on my, uh, on the Facebook group, uh, for those who still waiting on a copy or whatever. Um, I don't know if I'll still keep doing that the whole time, but, uh, but we'll see. I mean, if, you know, the Facebook group is set to private to avoid shenanigans and, you know, little things like that causing trouble, but, uh, we'll see how it goes, but there is the link once more for the Facebook group. And, this is Thursday. Tomorrow, maybe something from Fan Man. I saw him saying he didn't quite know. Do you know what's... Um, something's in the works. Something's in the works. Okay. Yeah. So uh, tomorrow. And then Saturday, of course, you can come back to my channel when it comes to rewatch because we're going to be watching Hitchcock's Vertigo. And if you didn't catch my little sell for it at the end of Tuesday Night's Noir last time, Vertigo is an amazing film. In fact, I would argue it's Hitchcock's masterpiece. Now, that's saying a lot because there are a lot of really great films that he did. But uh, I think it's just a masterpiece of storytelling. And it's there's so much to learn from it, even as writers or as, you know, whatever. So it's uh, it's going to be fun. Jimmy Stewart, Kim Novak, uh, Vertigo. It's available for like five or seven dollars even to own on Amazon. And you can find it in all the usual places as well. 
Uh, Sunday night is Matchsticks. Mr. Matchsticks Weeb Watch. He's going to be doing Ghost in the Shell and Thin Blue Line. No. Yep. Um, uh, no. Now, you know what? You said that, and now I, I can't. can't uh, 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 Sorry, Matchstick. <laughs> <laughs> Ghost yeah. in the Shell and Red Line something line. Oh, I remember the line the last time. I can see the picture. I thought it was Thin Blue Line. Blue. No, oh, it's blue. Perfect blue. Perfect blue. Thank you, Perfect Matchstick. Blue. God, you, you said that, and I, could, I knew blue was part of it, and then I blew my hair apart. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. You can check out that on Mr. Matchstick's channel. Um, Monday, of course, the talented and charming sound engraver will be talking to us about more deconstruction of art and music. I can't wait for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And then Tuesday, we'll be back on track with the usual Tuesday Night Noirs. Tuesday night, we're going to do another Hitchcock film called Notorious. And that's because I'm doing a, a thematic kind of thing with Vertigo and Notorious. No, no, Notorious. Yeah, no, not that one. <laughs> um, with uh, Vertigo being an exploration into the Jungian anima and Notorious being an exploration into the Jungian animus. So I'll explain those terms and we'll have some fun watching through, but notorious stars, Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. So a lot of fun with that one too. Uh, yeah. And next week uh, goes on with the usual stuff. So anything else uh, you want to say? Um, guess not. Okay. Appreciate the chant. Appreciate the chant anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Hopefully we've got a good, good uh, grip on scoundrels and uh we'll have some fun finding out what happens next i will have a nifty han solo avatar to go with albaca's sweet looking head over there next time but, so. but until then keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love thanks for watching oh. <laughs>